I can understand. Okay, we're rolling. As we're talking about the case of water, in terms of why distilled water is the critical water for the body to consume, is because distilled water is what you call H2O in its purest form. Mm -hmm. All water that you have that exists on Earth and elsewhere are basically contained in another source. In other words, that water has no shape of its own. It's what you call a liquid. So it can only retain a shape or it be reserved or uh, be in a sort of reservoir mm -hmm. uh, collection in something else, whether it be dirt, whether it be uh, some sort of um, natural or uh, artificial created surface, whether it's plastic, m steel, metal, or st a d stone. All that basically is the sources of how water is contained. Water is what's called the universal solvent in terms of it wears down any surface over enough time. So whenever you have water bore, bottled or put up in any source, ultimately along the time water will wear down or erode that actual surface. So then in that process you get harmful things that come from the outer surface that stores the water into the water. But the thing about distilled water is distilled water is pure H2O and that comes from the process in which the water is created. Mm -hmm. The water is actually, when you have the water, it doesn't matter what type of water you start off with, it could be very contaminated or not. The process of distilling it requires you to heat the water to a point where the water is no longer a liquid, but becomes a gas or vapor. What the heat of vaporization of water will allow the water to turn to steam and allow that to rise. And the other stuff that's in the water, even though initially you could not see it, because it doesn't have the same heat of vaporization as water does, it will still be either solid or liquid and left at the bottom. The goal is, however, to have the water turn to steam, but not to let it can recondense back into the actual chamber you heated it, but rather allow the steam to go into another chamber that's sterile and allow that to, to have where the steam to cool back into water. So in that case, you now have pure water, H2O, in terms of everything that was harmful in the water initially is removed. All those waters you talk about, whether it's tap water, um, so-called spring water, even filtered water, all those waters have harmful material in it, whether it's biological agents like diseases, viruses, things of nature, or uh, chemical, like you have lead or other types of poisons in the water that shouldn't be there, and sometimes even radioactive. But the thing is, through distilling, you can remove all those harmful contaminants, and that's what Gagat has brought about in terms of understanding the body needs pure H2O. It doesn't need water add additives, which you can consider all the harmful things in it. It's like a car. A car drives off of gasoline. It's not gasoline with some added sugar or some added sand. Because you can technically, that's still gasoline, but if you put gasoline with sand in it, or gasoline with sugar, or even salt in it, you try to run your car off of gasoline like that, if it doesn't automatically break down, it will break down very soon after usage of that type of gasoline. The same thing happens to your body. When you use water that has harmful materials in it, yeah, the body may be working or may work for some time, but ultimately it's going to break it down because the harmful things that you bring in through that water are not what the body needs. The body needs water in its pure form, not water with any minerals or additives. Wait and a minute. Now, that is one of the major reasons that uh, people say, distilled water is no good because they say it doesn't have minerals in it and uh, minerals the body needs and the body gets the minerals from the water. Now I know better because you know I, I, but for uh, uh, re going because I might have missed something uh, go back but I'm going to tell you what what I remember is that uh, uh, those minerals are still rock form as you pointed out and the body does not uh, uh, metabolize those minerals in rock form. Even though you can't see them, they're there in rock form. They're not metabolized in the way that the body uh, can utilize them. But plant minerals have taken those same rock forms because the roots go down and absorb the potassium, the iron, the zinc and and it processes it metabolizes it in its own system and then the body pulls those minerals from the plant in a way that the body can metabolize them and use them but I might have missed something so no you've actually succinctly actually described the actual process of where your minerals supposed to come from in terms of your food the plants are able to turn those particular minerals that the body needs 
into a form that can be digested by humans. For example, body needs, uh, humans need iron, but yet you can't take a piece of steel and bite into it and say that you got your iron or the supplement, because it's not in a form you can digest. Mm-hmm. However, the minerals that are absorbed for the plants, the plants are able to turn those actual stones or metals into a form which we can actually absorb and eat and consume. But again, it illustrates the points of minerals are supposed to come from the food, not the water. Mm-hmm. The water is meant as the ability of being able to actually fuel the blood or to be able to repopulate the blood because water is critical towards making sure your circulatory system works. The minerals that are supposed to help that are supposed to come from the food, not the water. So that's very important to understand. When you talk about mineral waters, mineral waters are just a fancy form for saying things like soda or carbonated water. Those are mineral waters because there are minerals that are added to those waters. But those things don't help the body. Soda water in particular destroys the bones and ultimately leads to all kinds of bad or harmful conditions of the body. So minerals, again, are not supposed to come from the water, but from the food. And the plants are the best form of getting those minerals, which are other sources, but the plants are the best because they are able to act, as Minister Brown stated, to uh, metabolize the metals and other things in the soil and to put it in the form that which can actually be ingested and digested by humans. Now, further dealing with water, they have machines now they're selling for four and five thousand dollars because they claim that they produce water that has a pH level of seven, eight, nine, whatever you want, and germs can't live uh, in an alkaline state. So these machines remove all the acidity from the water and give you pure, because they have filters, and give you a filtered, carbon filtered um, water that's pH balanced to the body's need. Um, How does distilled water become a better water than that? Distilled water is a perfect pH of seven. Now, you mentioned the machines do that, but the thing is filters have one common problem in terms of Filters are good up until a point. They can eliminate certain contaminants in water, but mm-hmm. there are other things that cannot. Carbon filters cannot get rid of certain type of uh, biological diseases as well as radioactivity and things of nature. And also some chemicals cannot also be absorbed by that. Distilled water works in a process of being able to separate the water from that particular carbon thing because once something's diluted into water, most of the times it can't be seen. The b- biggest mistake people have in terms of drinking tap water and things of that nature is because you pour a glass and you can see through it, you think that nothing's in the water. That's not true. As I said, water does, like if you take salt, mm-hmm. you pour it in water or even sugar, and you stir it, if you stir it enough times, the sugar and the salt dissolves in the water. You can't see it. Unless you actually saw the person pour it in or you actually remember that you, it was put in, you would not be able to know it was put in other than taste. And even then, you would not be able to actually detect that before, I mean, actually just seeing the water. The critical thing to understand is that water can dissolve or have anything basically ultimately over the time, the solvent can basically dissolve into that particular water source and be hidden. Distilled water eliminates that by being able to recognize the fact that if you heat water, the heat of vaporization of the turning of water from liquid to gas is different than most other substances. So whatever is in the water, the heat of vaporization that will turn water into steam will leave the other solids or harmful materials in still solid state or a liquid state. They won't turn to gas for the most part. You have then, when the steam is separated from the poisons or the harmful things, you let that steam be able to transfer into another system where it allows it to cool or actually settle in terms of going back from a gas to liquid, in terms of actually condensing. You then have pure water, provided that surface is sterile. You don't, want, you don't want the water to recondense back in the pot you heated it because then the harmful stuff is still there. And if it recondenses, it will go back into the water. And in the st- other pot you want to make, or the other source where the water steam is going to, you want to make sure that particular source is also sterile. sterile. Because if that's also dirty or has something in it, the water will recondense, but it will pick up whatever dirt or anything that was in that as well. So that's the process of distillation. The thing that's important to understand is that is the water that needs to be drunk because the body needs H2O. It did not say H2O with iron. It didn't say H2O with calcium. 
It's, the body needs H2O. Now, the body may need iron and calcium, but it's not supposed to come from the water. It's supposed to come from your food. Mm -hmm. No, whatever you wanted to go over today, I just wanted to deal with that because that was what was on my mind initially. So whatever you want, and believe me, I'm open. I appreciate it. Well, the message um, we wanted to really get across is the urgency to the pastors that we're talking to about mm -hmm. the actual briefing. And the best way we can do that is dealing with, as you know, the tape that we have in Dr. King. In terms of that particular tape we were talking about the other day, illustrates how Dr. King, who, like I said, he'd done some great things up, um, up until uh, 1968, the, day, uh, the, date, uh, the year that he was assassinated, in terms of voting rights and things of that nature. But he ultimately saw one day the real issue that pertains to black people in terms of the issue that black people have to solve which can't be solved from an Emancipation Proclamation or any other legal uh, amendment that's drafted up by others that weren't black or people that are not, where they did come from black people. And it comes about through, as I was telling, or, and so you yeah, shown to you, uh, Minister Brown, about the fact that he was able to see in that same year of 1968, the message that came from Professor James Brown, may his soul rest in perfect peace, who actually illustrated the very problem that black people suffer from in terms of the inability to love themselves or because of the conditioning and the Jim Crow fraud that's been put into the black people's minds, the inability to love themselves. Professor James Brown illustrated this in a song called Say It Loud, I'm Black and I'm Proud, which came out in 1968, which illustrated the very problem that really that confronts the black people. Voting rights and all and amendments are all right, but the the real problem that black people are suffering from is that self-hatred. And he recognized the talents that God blessed him. I'm talking about Professor James Brown. And realized that, who is he kidding? He can dance, he can sing, he can, he can write some of the most brilliant songs ever. He had no business being ashamed of who he was or being afraid of being labeled as black. And especially in a time like 1968, where almost no other artist would even dare to say or even try to even contemplate such a concept, he basically articulated that message. Mm -hmm. And by articulating that message, he illustrated the problem that black people have faced over Jim Crow. This same point was also illustrated by uh, um, Re uh, Dr. M uh, Minister Malcolm X. In terms of, in his also speech, he also illustrated the problem in terms of when he said, who taught you to hate yourself? When he talks about, when it comes to black people, who taught them to hate the color of their skin, the shape of their nose or uh, their eyes and lips, the color of their eyes, I mean. Also, any feature that's black, the hair uh, the hair quality, and things of that nature, all those things have been conditioned by black people by Jim Crow in terms of their inability to understand who they are, and more importantly, because of the Jim Crow fraud, they've been conditioned themselves into seeing themselves in terms of the worst light possible. Reverend Dr. King recognized what had happened with both Professor James Brown and Dr. Minister Malcolm X. Mm -hmm. And he began to realize that was the real goal that needs to be fought in terms of the, will, the, the real victory that black people needed to get is the ability to eliminate the Jim Crow fraud that was keeping them into this particular state of inferiority complex. And in that tape that we showed you, that particular clip that comes from 1968 where Dr. King is formally announcing it, that is the po po thing that we need to pastors to see and understand because when Dr. King, may first he basically established in that video, in the very beginning, he was talking about the fact that black people can't expect an Emancipation Proclamation or 14, 13, 14 to 15 amendments or any such thing that comes from others to solve the problems of black people. And he also talks about the fact that black people cannot lose their manhood which is a critical factor of this particular part in terms of when you have the Jim Crow is in effect, it has put black people in a position where they have lost their manhood because they've been forced to see themselves as less than human. Or more importantly, they see themselves as inferior to others. So ultimately, there's no way you can demonstrate a masculinity or manhood in that mm -hmm. system. Mm -hmm. In addition, Dr. King also realized that in reality, and as you saw in the end of that video, he said that he was black and he was proud primarily because he realized there was no business being ashamed of who he was. God blessed him to be black and the ability to have the ability to speak 
and talk and to gather people together through his intelligence, blessed by him because of being black. So he, he had no basis of being ashamed of who he was or being ashamed of being a black person or an African here in America. The whole thing that needs now to be understood, though, is that was Dr. King's real goal, not so much the dream or the voting rights, which is what he's popularly known for now, but rather what he was beginning to understand in 1968 in that particular piece. And it's on YouTube, which you can see in terms of the Dr. King, Say It Loud, I'm Black and I'm Proud, where he actually sings and s actually states that particular lyric coming from Professor Brown. But he learned from those individuals like Professor Brown and Dr. Uh, Malcolm um, um, X, primarily because of the fact that they were able to see, to all three of them at the, uh, in reality were able to see the important part about the struggle of black people was realizing and recognizing that the Jim Crow that is preventing black people from being able to be themselves and ultimately being in a position where they're forced to act as something they're not. You, regardless of how long it's been active, that's the case. But the thing is that Jim Crow has to be busted and the busting of that Jim Crow comes through being able to establish black people and a love for themselves. Mm -hmm. So that was particularly stated, that message. Now, the thing that the pastors need to realize is that Dr. King's goal, and also uh, Professor James Brown and uh, Dr. Uh, Malcolm X's goal, in terms of liberating black people, has been achieved and attained by GAGAT. GAGAT, which stands for God Almighty's Grand Unified Theory. It's a revelation which comes from God, which infallibly proves that all theorems, also called everything that exists, and all equations, past, present, and future, originates out of one invariant, GI, defined by Gagat as God, with orthogonal components, GIJ, and with a divergence of GIJ, comma, J equals zero. Why this is particularly important is Gagat has, in effect, eliminated the problems that the black people have faced over the last 2,500 years. Yes, I use the term 2,500 years because the problems began even before the last 500 years of us coming to America. But even before then, when we had invaders from the European countries, whether it be the Greeks, whether it be the Romans, Southern Europeans, which are commonly now referred to as Arabs when the Islam was spread, and the Northern Europeans again during the last uh, 500 years, all those are invasions from the uh, Europeans coming into Africa and causing our problems. Pr the late Professor uh, Chinua Achebe, may his soul rest in perfect peace, a brilliant Nigerian author who, uh, who was a very a master literature, uh, who wrote the master literature piece called Things Co Fall Apart. He actually declared in that particular um, masterpiece work the real reason why problems occurred in Africa in terms of Things fell apart in Africa upon the arrival of the Europeans, which is very true, because ultimately, in effect, the Europeans, which many black people are not aware of, have declared war on black people. But unfortunately, because it's not specifically declared or declared in such a way that it is known to black people, black people are not aware of that war, which has waged for, like I said, two and a half millennia, or 2,500 years. Why that's particularly important is the fact that the Europeans have, for the longest time, trying to, the basis of their fighting wars is a means of being able to prove who is superior to the other. Every war that you consider, in European society that is, that they've done has been a basis of proving who is superior. The whole point is Gagat, in effect, has ultimately won the ultimate war in terms of who is the most intelligent. The Europeans had tried through many means, through fraud and other things, to prove that they were the most intelligent. But in the end, God had proven, through Gagat, that black people are the most intelligent race. And that comes about through the fact that Professor Gio Yibo, who is the actual professor ordained by God and a black man, a man, an African who, who's here in America, has been declared by God and ordained by God with what's called the infinite intelligence polymorphism which is A to sub N. Polymorphisms are basically a term that basically refers to intelligence. Human beings have the ability to use polymorphisms in the brain to understand or to collapse reality or data that they see through the eyes or for vision and be able to interpret it within the brain. The more polymorphisms a creature has, the more ability that creature has to be able to understand and compress reality. Can you give us a little deeper insight to poly? Morphisms. How can a layman 
Yes. Uh, digest that. But like I said, it's a coded word, but polymorphism basically means the ability to collapse or compress reality into the brain and to have that brain interpreted. For example, our brains and eyes are fixed size. However, our brains can still interpret things that are much larger than our brains and much larger than our eyes. Like, for example, when you enter a room, like the room we're in right now, the room is clearly larger than the eye or the brain that the human has to uh, interpret the material. However, through the ability of polymorphisms, you can compress that actual uh, room by looking at it through the eye, and then through the eye, it compresses the information into the brain. When it does that, the polymorphisms give you the ability to interpret the actual room. So like, for example, if you want to learn, uh, if you enter a room, through that ability of polymorphism, you can determine where you'd like to sit, where you want to go into a room if there was something you wanted to get to eat or a book to read or something to that effect. That is the basis of polymorphism, the basis of intelligence. Now, when you say compress, um, can you give me an analysis of a polymorphing compression with a uh, digital video compression? Is there any relationship to yes. this? Like the camera that you have here, it's in, actually the camera's lens are far smaller than myself or the room we're in, but it's able to capture the essence of what's going on right now because of the fact that it has the ability to, through the lens, to actually take the view of what's here around it and co actually collapse it in terms of a form that can be seen by others who will want to watch this or see this later. But the thing is, the human brain goes more than that in terms of not only does the human brain does what the actual camera does in terms of being able to take the information that's around or what it can see and actually collapse it. By collapsing, I mean it takes a space that's larger than itself or larger than the eye or the brain. Like this room is far larger than the brain or the eye. But yet you can see every part of it through the eye because of that ability in terms of polymorphism. But it's not just being able to collapse the information into the brain. The camera can do that. What the camera can't do is actually interpret the information. The human brain can. When you see the room, like I said, if I was entering from this door, or if I'm sitting here and I wanted to get out, I can see the room. The room is compressed inside my brain. I can see and interpret that space as a door. So I know if I want to go out, I know that's a door I can leave. My brain not only interprets that as a door, but then the path to get to the door to leave. Mm -hmm. That is the basis of what we call polymorphism. The more so you could say the same thing about a telescope that yes, looks out again, into space. Yes, but again, the telescope and the camera does not have the ability to interpret the data. It can record it, but it doesn't actually have the intelligence. There's no intelligence in the camera. It can't actually, actually interpret information like a human can. Mm -hmm. The humans have the ability because of that polymorphism. The analogy I was giving with the cameras about the lens in terms of being able to capture information that's larger than the actual material or the camera itself into the camera, but it doesn't have the ability to actually make any interpretation or any ability to actually analyze that, the data. The human brain does, however. That's the, one of the reasons why polymorphism, as I said, is a measure of intelligence. The more a human being or a character or a pure person has that in polymorphism, the more ability they are to see. For example, our eyes have a fixed vision limit. There's a certain part where if you're looking for your unaided eye, and even with a camera, it can only go so far. It has only a certain range. Mm -hmm. But if you're able to go beyond that range, then you can see more and interpret more. Mm. If you have po more polymorphisms in the brain. And that's because all polymorphisms originate out of eta sub n, which is a formula that has come out through Gaga. Because that formula has been, I mean, imputed in Professor Ebo's brains, he contains all polymorphisms. It's not just the, Aita Semen is not just the origin of all polymorphisms, but it contains all polymorphisms. As n approaches infinity, it means it's, and it could be any number. And infinity means in their infinite numbers. So the thing why that's important is the fact that when you have Aita Semen being any number, it means it contains all polymorphisms. Since Professor Yibo has the formula which contains all polymorphisms, it means that in effect, Professor Yibo has all, or the ability to collapse all of reality, or all of space, like the entire universe, into his brains and understanding. This is a power that God has blessed him with, and that has made him the most intelligent race. The reason why you can say that, and again, this is, comes from the concept of proof, 
in terms of uh, Professor Hugo being the most intelligent, is the absolute and hardest evidence that shows this is the fact that no one else had the formula of Eta Sabet for Gagat. And in effect, it cannot be reproduced either. Gagat, since it contains all polymorphisms, since there's no limit, because n could be any number as n approaches infinity, there's no chance of anyone saying, well, here's a polymorphism that Professor Yibo did not discover or did not present in a later or future point. So all polymorphisms are embedded and uh, are interpreted through that eta sabet. The other part, that, part that's, that needs to be understood is by Professor Yibo being ordained by God as the ultimate intelligence or the greatest human intelligence. Because African people share the genes of Professor Yibo, that makes them the most intelligent race. The reason is as follows. Let's even say, and this is a case we can prove by contradiction, in terms of let's even say that Professor Hebo was a fluke, that he has infinite intelligence polymorphisms and the rest of the black people supposedly have zero. If you go to any other race, whether it be Europeans, Asians, Jewish, uh, Hispanic, well, Hispanic's not a race, but uh, any other race that's considered to be non-black, if you were to take their actual polymorphism count, it would be a finite number, meaning that even though it may not be specifically described, the number would still be a finite number, like 19 or, or something to that effect. If the Africans have just Professor Yibo, who has infinite intelligence polymorphisms, infinite intelligence polymorphisms are still greater than a finite number of polymorphisms for all the others. Even if you add them together or keep them separate, there'll be a finite number. Professor Yibo has been blessed and ordained by God with the ultimate intelligence through all polymorphisms that have been embedded inside his brains. Everyone, not just a couple, not just a large number, but all, which is infinite. So even if the black race supposedly had zero, by Professor Yibo having infinite compared to all other races having a finite or limited number, that makes black people the most intelligent. In reality, black people do not, uh, other than Professor Yibo, are not zero polymorphisms but they have a high number of polymorphisms as well. So that automatically, again, the proof of contradiction is taking the very worst case and showing that even in that case, that the, 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 the count of the intelligence polymorphisms that, or, or that black people have because Professor Hebo is infinite, as opposed to the other races having finite, is exact exa a proof of that being the case of the Africans being the most intelligent. If you take a case of Africans do having higher polymorphisms than zero, even with Professor Yibo having infinite, that still makes black people the most intelligent race. Mm -hmm. So why is this important? What does this have to do with Dr. King, you may ask? Again, Dr. King and um, Professor James Brown and uh, Dr. Malcolm X all illustrated the point of black people not being able to be themselves or having a self-hatred, and self-hatred coming out of Jim Crow. It is the Jim Crow that has kept black people from recognizing themselves as the most intelligent race. Gagat has decoded this back in 1990, which is 23 years ago. But in seven years later, there's a Yale study that came out that was actually forced by Gagat that came from Yale University here in America, along with other several major uh, universities in the European world, like Canada, uh, Italy, France, and so forth. There's a professor in this particular Yale study called Professor Kenneth K. Kidd, also KKK, which is not a coincidence there, in terms of that particular, uh, the letters of his, all three of the letters of his first, middle, and last name are K, so it's KKK. But in effect, that particular Yale study declared Africans as being the most intelligent. It stated specifically, it talks again about polymorphisms, but again, the polymorphism to the lay person, if they don't have the Gagat background, which I'm presenting to you now, they would not be able to understand that, to what polymorphisms mean, or the fact that it's a coded de language in that particular Yale study. In terms of, Gagat has decoded that in reality, that study has declared Africans having 28 polymorphisms, 15 that are common amongst all human populations, and 13 which are endemic or additional with African peoples. So 15 plus 13 polymorphisms are 28 polymorphisms. It now, how did they determine those polymorphisms? Though? How the did research, they determine your For the research in the DAX data. The other thing they also determined was in the non-black populations, which includes Europeans, Asians, Jews, and others, it determined that they had 15 polymorphisms, which are shared amongst all populations, and four which are endemic to non-Africans or non-blacks. 
So 15 plus 4 is 19. What they've declared in this study is that Africans are the most intelligent by having a ratio of 28 polymorphisms to 19 polymorphisms. And why that is critical is, although the 28 is an underestimate, because in reality, Professor Yibo has been ordained by God with infinite intelligence polymorphisms, the 28 is an underestimate, a very, very, very underestimated number. However, what God had forced Europeans to do is to actually declare, by even the 28, which is underestimate, over 19, that Africans are the most intelligent by that. God had forced them to do that, because in reality, the Yale study was actually conducted to actually prove that the Europeans were the most intelligent. But because Jim Crow was busted by Gagat, the fraud that would have made that uh, would have made them to present a false image of the Europeans being most intelligent uh, was actually busted and the truth came out which showed that Africans are the most intelligent. They actually declared this in the Yale study by actually saying that the European dot bias in the ascertainment of the p nuclear polymorphism was actually removed. In other words, the Jim Crow, which is another word for European bias, European bias is another term for Jim Crow in effect, once that was removed from their research, they were able to obtain the correct results. That is why this particular Yale study is important. You may think of it as a, oh, it's just some paper, some abstract. But in reality, the paper is critical because it actually is the official position of the government, the American government and the world government, in terms of them illustrating the fact that African peoples or black people are the most intelligent race. That automatically destroys Jim Crow because Jim Crow had presented the picture of black people being the dumbest, or the so-called the lowest of intelligence. That is what, again, why we mean by J uh, Dr. King's goal in terms of Jim Crow has been now eliminated, in terms of the fraud of Jim Crow that has kept black people at the bottom, or keeping themselves in a position of self-hatred and hating themselves, has been eliminated, because now the truth has been declared. And the position is official. It's mathematical through the actual God's order, it's scientific and it's official by the Yale study and other coded documents that after 2,500 years of fraud pertaining to the Africans or the black people's intelligence, that God would actually declare Professor Yibo with the ultimate intelligence polymorphism as the greatest or the most intelligent human being ever created. And because Africans share the genes that Professor G. Yibo has, that makes Africans the most intelligent race. All this is critical towards why the pastors need to be aware of this particular announcement because the pastors need to realize, especially the ones in the Baptist Church, that there's a partnership between us in terms of the well, OFAPIT Institute of Technology, whom Professor Yibo is the chairman of the mathematics department there, and myself of being a actual staff member as well, and the actual churches. In terms of the progressive, there was a actual resolution from the New York State Progressive Baptist Convention actually headed by a, one of the former presidents, vice presidents of the National Progressive Baptist Convention by the name of the late Reverend uh, Parker, may his soul rest in perfect peace, in terms of he actually sent a delegation from his church at Wayside Baptist Church in Brooklyn to actually not only work on terms of creating and drafting the actual New York State Progressive Baptist Convention resolution on Gawkut, but also, he actually sent a delegation from here to go to Nigeria to work with the legislative body in Nigeria, in terms of the Nigerian Senate, on what's called the Gagat Nigerian Senate Motion Bill, number 151, as well. Both documents were created and passed. And the reason why that's particularly important is it not only is a connection between the Africans of diaspora here in America and Africans in Africa uh, with the Nigerians, but also it illustrates the fact that, in reality, the Nigerian people actually understood the significance and importance of Gaga to such an extent that the vote upon that particular resolution was unanimously in favor of it. In other words, most of the times when some things are passed like this in Nigeria, you expect to be a, for people for and against. There's always going to be an opposition to something. But this is the first time in Nigerian history where when the resolution was issued on Gaga, uh, or the uh, Gaga uh, Nigerian Senate motion, number 151 was issued, the votes upon it in terms of the Nigerian Senate were unanimous for it. There was no mm. one against or opposed it. Mm. And that's a first in Nigerian history and in African history. Sorry. So why this is particularly important is that Gagat has, in effect, brought about the change that black people need in terms of resolving the problems of the last 2,500 years with the black people. In addition, like I said, there's a partnership between us and the church in terms of the church now needs to recognize this partnership and completed. Although the actual resolution has been uh, actually created, there are certain things in the actual resolution that need to be taken up by the actual pastors. 
one of the parts that it talks about in terms of one of the things that resolved is the fact that Gaget can solve the problems of incurable diseases such as HIV, AIDS, Parkinson's disease, heart, uh, heart uh, attacks, heart uh, disease, stroke, um, diabetes, and other deadly conditions which people in the churches right now are suffering from and dying from unnecessarily. Gaget has a solution to that through the GIJ, which comes out of Gaget, or out of the Gaget formula. Why this is particularly important is that we have a, what's called the Gaget Life Saving and Riemann Hypothesis Briefing, which is the end of every month, but we're hoping to get an audience of 7,000 to 10,000 people, primarily because, one, we have a lifesaver, which everyone in the church needs. And the resolution that came out to the New York State Progressive Baptist Convention is a legal document here in New York State, which illustrates that the churches, first of all, this is for the church is being offered this opportunity to come to life-saving breathing. And right now, many times, dollars are spent unnecessarily or wasted on going to hospitals who cannot treat or solve your problem because, in effect, there's no real black hospital out there. The hospitals that you go to, like LIJ and others, are basically institutions of uh, what you call the inferior strands or the 19 strands. And when we talk about uh, 28 polymorphisms to 19 polymorphisms, you can see there's 28 intelligence DNA strands to 19 intelligence DNA strands, which further simplifies to a ratio of 9 to 6. If you divide 28 by 3, it's 9 and a third. If you divide tw uh, 19 by 3, you get 6 and a third. If you eliminate the thirds, you're left with 9 to 6. Nine strands of intelligence DNA for blacks as opposed to six intelligence DNA strands for non-blacks. But the, the hospitals that are currently in place are all controlled by non-blacks. So in reality, you don't have a real black hospital. That's the first thing. The second thing is by putting people that have less intelligence than you in a position to solve problems is already a disaster. It's like you as a parent going to a child, expecting your child to explain to you as a parent what's two plus one. Especially when, as a parent, you are supposed to have superior intelligence to the child. To expect a child or someone with less intelligence to solve a problem like that for you, like 2 plus 1, is a serious problem. And that's the same situation that is going on when you go to six strands of intelligence or non-black for a solution to a problem like heart disease, high blood pressure, and uh, diabetes, and other such deadly conditions. They can't help you because they do not have the intelligence to. You have been blessed by God as African people with the intelligence. Therefore, only you and your people can solve the problems your people face for you. Which is why the briefing is so critical, because it not only explains the fact that you cannot expect a problem like this to be solved by the so-called hospitals, which are controlled by six strands, but rather gives you the means of understanding that also, the re other thing that's important is those hospitals do not even understand the nature of life. Only Gagat has decoded the true nature of what life is. If you go into any dictionary to define life in the European system or the non-black system, you, I guarantee you will not have a definition for life. In effect, if they do not have a definition for life, how can they protect something like life if they don't understand it? On the other hand, Gagat, because it contains all knowledge, it has the actual definition of life, and because we have the definition of life, we can protect and save life, something that cannot be done in the so-called hospitals which are controlled by six strands today. So the first thing to understand is there's no hospital for the black people. At best, when you put yourself in the so-called six strands of intelligence hospital, the non-blacks hospitals, you're putting yourself in a gamble where you may survive or may even go through surgery and survive, but the gambles are uh, stacked heavily against you. It's that most likely you will be, you'll be murdered or killed in the hospital because they do not understand the problems you suffer from, nor do they have the intelligence to solve it. Only Gagat and the Ofapit Institute of Technology can solve the problems that black people face. And also the other condition is most of those people, non-blacks, do not have any love for you as a black person either. So you can't expect them, as someone who does not have love for you, to be able to solve your problems. Mm -hmm. That is again all going back to what Dr. King recognized in terms of the black manhood and the ability for black people to see themselves as not being the lowest but rather the best or the most blessed person from God comes out through this. Because only go people God bless is the, uh, uh, in terms of being able to have the intelligence to, to solve specific and serious problems like health, like the ones I just mentioned, can only come through people who are the most intelligent. Again, the analogy I just brought about, about 
going to a child, having a parent going to a child to ha expect to answer to 2 plus 1, or to have a 2 plus 1 explained to the parent by the child, is like a black person who has 9 intelligence strands going to a 6 intelligence strand hospital and expecting them to solve their problems for them. You can see the disastrous nature of that situation. That's right. So that's one of the reasons why the briefing has to be filled. And we need 7,000 to 10,000 people at the very least, primarily because the whole community needs to be there. And we're looking for ventures to have the particular briefing. But the thing is that the most important part about this is that the people understand that Gagat is the only tool that has basically completed the task that Dr. King, Professor James Brown, and Dr. Malcolm X all illustrated in terms of getting black people their manhood back and in general getting black people in a position to recognize the blessing God has given them by being black. Blackness is directly connected and correlated with intelligence. So it's no longer saying a matter of, oh well, I'm black, I should be ashamed or, you know, the I should be looking up to six strands because that's what's been propagated through Jim Crow. In reality, Gaga has proven that African people are the most intelligent race because we share the genes of Professor Gioyibo, who has been ordained by God as the ultimate intelligence. So this is the point we need to get across in terms of the pastors, and they need to see this particular video so they can understand this particular aspect. Let me ask you, uh, did you finish? Because I wanted you to finish, and then I yeah. want to ask you a question. Why is mathematics considered the language of God? Mathematics is what you call the language of God, primarily because it's a language of truth. It's been unfortunately obfuscated in terms of many times mathematics is presented to people in a way that's not really helpful or d dubbed confusing by many because it's not explained. But Gaga has actually decoded that mathematics in reality is a, uh, a study of language, I mean study of truth, in terms of it's a language of truth. And one of the reasons why it's called a language of God is because of truth. God is the ultimate truth. And the whole thing is, when you talk about mathematics being a study of truth, it comes down from simply understanding what is the concept of truth. Truth, in reality, is what you call a theorem in mathematics. A theorem is basically something that exists. Why that's important is that if you take the, like, for example, 2 plus 1 equals 3, that's a theorem. A theorem, however, is a statement that can be proved to be mathematically true. It's not just a matter of me saying, well, 2 plus 1 is 3, or that it's obvious that that in itself is a proof. The way to prove it is then understanding what does 2 plus 1 equal 3 actually mean. Taking the terms, defining the terms, or using the terms definitions, and then understanding those definitions to actually mathematically analyze what this statement is saying to then verify if it is in fact true. So let's take the 2 plus 1 part of that. 2 plus 1 basically has two parts to it. It defines 2, which is the number 2. If you take to one hand and put two fingers, you have two fingers, which represents the 2. The 1 is represented by a 1, which is 1 on the other hand. Addition is an, a defined as an operation that says if you have sets of numbers, you combine or count the numbers together, which is what addition is. So 2 plus 1 means you take the 2 in one hand and the 1 in the other and count them together. You get 1, 2, 3. Since you've now shown that 2 plus 1 is equal to 3, that is a proof. Or in Latin they say QED. But the thing that's important is that mathematically that has been proven. That is the basis of proof, or truth in reality. Truth is ability to be able to say something that you can prove. And that is what mathematics is about. So mathematics is the language of God primarily because it allows one to be able to use the mathematical arguments and logic and dedu deduction to basically prove a point. And mathematics all comes out of God because everything, because I said theorems, which are truth, it represents everything that exists. You yourself, whoever's listening to this, is a theorem. I am a theorem because I exist. I can, you can see me, you can, I can touch myself, I can hear myself. All those are verifications that I exist as a human being. The same can be said of you, whoever's listening, or yourself, Mr. Brown, in terms of you can see yourself, you can touch yourself, you can hear yourself. Those are all verifications that you exist. Your theorem because of that existence. All existence originates out of what's called the GIJ, which is the representation of God defined by Gagat. So again, this is the critical factor that needs to be brought across to our people in terms of God is ultimately the ultimate source of everything that exists. 
or the original, ultimate origin, origin or ultimate origin or originator of everything that exists. And since everything that exists is a theorem, and mathematics strictly deals with theorems, you can see that dealing with existence, or everything that exists, will deal with mathematics, and how mathematics, in effect, is dealing with God. Can you have science without mathematics? Mathematics and science are basically closely related in terms of sciences, for the most part, are supposed to deal with truth. The only problem with science as opposed to mathematics in times is because of the nature. Mathematics has what you call theorems, as we just described. The ability to prove something is true. In science, a lot of the problems originate out of the concept of not so much having theorems in science, although you can, but most of the time in science you deal with what's called theory or conjecture. And theory is good up until a point, because theory allows you to say certain things, but there's no solid of the actual proof of that. Like, for example, theory is basically saying that we have nine planets in our solar system, in a sense. Yes, technically we can see and observe that, but it's not been proven that's the final number. There may be more, or something that we may consider a planet, like Pluto, may not be a planet at all. But the thing is, those are theories. In science, because of the nature of science, and science in many ways can be considered as, in most cases, like uh, physics and engineering and electrical engineering and things of those sorts, can be considered applied mathematics in reality, mathematics applied to specific scenarios. In reality, in those cases, there are theorems, but there are other cases where things are con left as theory or conjecture. And the whole point is, mathematics is superior in that sense in that when you have a theorem, when you can prove something to be mathematically true, it supersedes theory or experiment, which is another thing that's done a lot in science. For example, in mathematics, you can prove a triangle is a three-sided polygon or a shape that's closed with three sides. You can't conduct any experiment in physics or in engineering to prove that a triangle does not have three sides or more than three sides or less. Because if you do conduct any experiment that shows that a triangle does not have three sides, has even more or less than three sides, that cannot be because the theorem that proves that triangles have three sides by its definition and so forth automatically excludes any possibility of that being disproved. Because there's a theorem that shows and proves mathematically a triangle has three sides, you cannot ha conduct an experiment or a theory that contradicts that. That is, again, the power of mathematics in terms of dealing with theorems as opposed to science which deals with experimentation or empirical research and uh, what's called theory. Um, when you talk about mathematics, I hear some people say that mathematics uh, depends the truth of mathematics. You know, it, it, we go one, two, three, four into infinity. But that's a base. I, I, I guess it's a, a zero, one, a zero, ten base. I don't know what the base is. But they say if you change the base, then the applied uh, results of that mathematical theorem or theory would be different. And so mathematics can be different depending on the base. But what I wanted you to speak to in covering that is the universality of the mathematics that we use, which is arithmetic, um, the counting of one to nine, uh, zero to nine, however you want to explain it, been universally uh, accepted as truth and therefore we can apply mathematics universally because it is accepted universally as truth. Is there proof to that truth? There is. Again, the base is an interesting concept in mathematics, but in reality that doesn't really pertain any real change. It doesn't really affect the, what we just presented about a to sub n being infinite or all the, uh, all the equations that we talk about in terms of polymorphism embedded within an infinite intelligence polymorphism. And that comes from the fact that bases, whether you talk about the, in terms of the system we use now, the terms of the, uh, what you call a decimal system of things that nature is based off of 10, in terms of 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, and every other number is combinations of those. You can have other bases but the thing is, those number systems still do not change the fact that y either one way you look at those systems, they still go on forever. They're infinite. Mm. And in fact, all those other systems, base systems, 
are basically will have a going on, they don't reach a final number. So the whole point is all of them approach infinity, in effect. Mm -hmm. Gaga already incorporates it because a to sub n, as n goes to infinity, doesn't, there's no specification of base. The thing is, however, because all numbers have no end, that means they approach what's called affinity, meaning they go on, they, they have no end. It doesn't matter what base you're in, as long as you understand that an n can be any number, that means that anything, any number system, any base system is incorporated within Gaga. So base is not important in terms of that factor. The thing that's important, however, is mathematics, like I said, is a language of truth. The ability to understand nature around us through Gaga doesn't depend on base. All that it depends on is understanding the GIJ and the A to sub N. Um, let me ask you this. The history of mathematics as it relates to world leadership and human development, how, how would you, how would you, how would you bring that to us to show us that mathematics is the foundation of all human development? Well, as you mentioned, mathematics is the foundation of all uh, human development because it's truth in reality. But specifically, some of the representations of that truth, because I said before, you talk about theorems, but sometimes theorems can be represented by equations. And equations are a very critical part about mathematics. Equations mm -hmm. also liberate people into positions of leadership. I can give you certain examples that will help illustrate this point even clearer in terms of, if you go back to the late 1600s, early 1700s, in England, in Cambridge University, you have a professor by the name of Sir Professor Mike, uh, Isaac Newton. Sir Professor Isaac Newton is considered to be one of the greatest mathematicians of all time. In terms of Newton, Euler, and Gauss in the European society are considered to be the three greatest mathematicians. Newton is credited for coming up with a concept called calculus, which is the study of rates of change, despite the fancy title which scares people. And again, that's a... Again, again uh, calculus is the study of, of rates, rates of, change. of change. How do you put that in a way that our young people can understand it and see that they don't yes. have to be afraid of calculus? Calculus, again, is just a, when you have to, originally in mathematics, you start with arithmetic. From arithmetic, you then get into what's called algebra. Algebra is only difference for arithmetic. Arithmetic basically dealing with things like addition, subtraction, multiplication, division, operations simple like that. Algebra now incorporates, instead of just numbers in those addition, subtraction, multiplication, division, you now incorporate variables, which can be represented by letters. Variables being different than numbers, because numbers have a specific defined quantity. One is one, two is two, three is three, and so forth. But in the case of algebra, instead of like in arithmetic, you can have a case like two plus three, which is obviously five. In the case of algebra, you can have something like 2 plus a, where a is a variable that's not known is equal 5 or equal 7. And you'd have to determine a through certain rules in terms of if you have an unknown and you have other terms that are known, the key is to balance the equation in such a way so that you have the unknown term or unknown terms on one side and whatever that's known, like the actual number quantities, brought to the other side of the equal sign. And that would help you solve it. That's the whole basis of algebra. In the case then, you also have then incorporate geometry, which is what's called the study of shapes. Since we all exist as a three-dimensional shape, all of us are basically geometry. But of course, in mathematics, we deal with two-dimensional level geometry and then three-dimensional geometry. But again, geometry is the study of shapes. The geometry basically also being broken down, uh, the origin of that comes from the trying to understand the measure of Earth, or the ability to understand how the shapes or how certain things in the heavens moved like stars, planets, and so forth. But the point I wanted to get across in terms of Newton, in terms of Newton and the time he lived in Cambridge in the late 1600s, early 1700s, there was a search towards understanding the nature of the universe that began even before Newton, about over a millennia beforehand, or over a thousand years before 1600. It goes back to, again, the times of our ancient ancestors in Kemet, uh, trying to understand the nature of the stars and the actual planetary motion. They demonstrated that understanding through the pyramids, in terms of the pyramids, which is the only structure that has, of all the seven wonders of the world, has remained intact, despite looting and sabotage by foreign powers that have come into Kemet, unfortunately, this day, mm -hmm. like the Arabs that are currently there now, or even the Europeans. 
the Arabs, again, are Southern Europeans as opposed to Northern Europeans as well, who have come into Africa and tried to take the claim for the pyramids, but they, they didn't. And the best way to prove that also is the fact that the Shabaka stone by Pharaoh Shabaka, who actually illustrated the mathematical knowledge of the time during his reign in Egypt, the Shabaka stone was actually being used by Arabs in the last 20 or 30 years to grind wheat. They used a stone with such knowledge, such incredible knowledge, used to try to grind seeds or grind uh, uh, grain. So the whole thing is, again, if they were the ones who created the pyramids in so-called ancient Kemet or ancient Egypt, they would never have used the document for such a mundane or such a, t a task. But the thing is, again, that's like I said, invasion of non-blacks into Africa and then taking the credit for it. But getting back to what I was saying about Chewbacca stone and the pyramids, the uh, pyramids are organized in such a way so that they even actually connect to certain constellations in the sky. Certain pyramids in Giza and other areas actually are arranged in such a way that they actually mirror stars in actual heavens. The thing that's important about that is the fact that the basis of most mathematics comes from trying to understand the nature of our universe in reality. For the longest time, there was a trying to understand the nature of how our planet rotates or moves relative to, the, say, the stars or other planets. In the early part of the, of the, the one of the things that's uh, also important is many of the Greeks that try to claim geometry. First of all, there are no pyramids in Greece. How exactly do the pyramids, uh, how do the Greeks claim superiority in ge uh, geometry and yet the greatest uh, geometric figure, the pyramids, don't exist in so-called originator of all geometry. And more to the point, the Greeks that they credit for these type of things like Pythagoras and others like that, Pythagoras spent most of his time studying in Africa. Pythagoras is famous for the Pythagorean theorem. He spent most of his time in Africa, although the, the place he was in Africa had a Greek name, it was still in Africa. So the important thing is, the Greeks came to Africa to learn from the ancient Kemetic people, but because of, again, the war for supremacy, they stole the knowledge and tried to present it as their own. But the Gaga has decoded in reality that knowledge came from Africa. The important thing to understand is that this particular search for understanding how the planets moved, how the stars moved, came to various representations of mathematics and models. A man by the name of Ptolemy, who, although Greek sounding name it is, it was actually an African who postulated the first system which called the geocentric model of the universe. That model consisted of Earth being the center and all other planets, including the Sun, rotating around the actual Earth in a circular orbit. Mm -hmm. There were certain things that were correct about that in terms of, yes, planets rotate around in a somewhat circular orbit, but in reality that was not the truth of the matter, and Earth was definitely not the center of the solar system, or our system. But, but that before, was it was thought that the Earth was the center of the solar system. Yes, that's what came, came out of the geocentric model, through Ptolemy. A thousand years later, people started to actually challenge that in terms of people by the name of, in the European society, like... Uh, Copernicus. Uh, Copernicus was a German astronomer and mathematician who also uh, recognized that in reality the real system could not be Earth-based in terms of, you couldn't have a system based with the Earth as a center, but rather a sun or star. Well, didn't the Africans know that the sun was a center? Again, that's what I'm saying. The knowledge was there, but in terms of the European society, it was not. Oh, okay. Again, I'm trying to illustrate the importance of equations, since you asked me before, the yes. equations role in mm -hmm. terms of de development. In the European society, they believe a geocentric model. And the thing that's important is Copernicus, also later on Galileo, who's an Italian astronomer and physicist as well. Well, not so much physicist, but I mean astro, astro astronomer. And um, also... Um, Johannes Kepler, a German mathematician and also scientist as well. Let me well, ask you one thing while it's on my mind, then I want you to come back to that. You said that the Africans knew that the sun was the center of, of our universe anyway. Uh, what, proof, uh, what, what proof is that? They're actually, system. like I was saying, the pyramids. The pyramids are actually arranged in certain constellations mirroring the stars. The stars were recognized as the central source of wherever you have a solar system or planet system that the planets have to orbit a sun. Another way you can see that is even look at Amun-Ra and the titles. Ra and Amun basically dealing with the sun god. 
and things of that nature. All that was recognized as the sun being a central or key part of the actual nature of the universe. It was understanding that stars, the sun is basically a star, mm -hmm. the sun in effect. The star has the central significance or importance in the system of planets. The thing is, in the could, European... Sorry. Could you have had a calendar? Yes, calendar without, actually... Could you have had a calendar without a recognition of no. the sun as the center? No, the calendar comes about... and A uh, calendar actually originates out of a Kemetic and African word. But the thing is, calendar can only come about through understanding seasons. And seasons only occur from a planet's motion around a star, or a sun in our case. Seasons occur when you have a star, the orbit which the planet takes around that star determines seasons. On Earth we have spring, summer, winter, and fall. All those are actually determined by the actual orbit of the planet around the sun. And again, that was actually represented as I was going later on, uh, trying to explain in terms of Copernicus, mm -hmm. Galileo, and um, Kepler especially, were all able through actual empirical research. Empirical research basically did with experimental or using equipment, scientific equipment to determine and observe the natures of the stars and so forth, that the Earth couldn't be the center of the universe. And more importantly, in the case of Kepler, Kepler came up with, a German mathematician, with what's called free laws of planetary motion, which determined that in reality, a planet orbits a star, not so much in a circular orbit, but what's called an elliptical orbit. The difference between elliptical and a circle orbit is a matter of eccentricity. Eccentricity is a fancy term basically meaning how much does a trajectory deviate from a circle. A circle obviously will not deviate from a circle, so the eccentricity of a circle is zero. But an ellipse is basically what you call a stretch circle. If you take a circle, circle in mathematics is defined as a locus or collection of points equidistant from a central point. You have a central point and a distance from that central point. Every point that you can take that's that same distance around that point will make up a circle. That's the locus of points that, uh, that are equidistant from a central point. That's a fancy term for what mathematics is. But locus is a fancy term meaning a collection of points. All the points that you make up that are that same distance from a center is that collection of points, which is a circle. When you have a ellipse, an ellipse is different in terms of that circle has many features. The distance from that center to any part of the outer part of the circle is what's called a radius. A distance going from two points outside of the circle and going through the center is called the diameter. Diameter being the largest chord, chord basically connecting two outer points of the circle together. Mm -hmm. The diameter is the largest chord of the circle. Half of that diameter is what's called the radius. In the case of an ellipse, an ellipse is a, what you call a stretched out circle in terms of if you take one of the axes or one of the radi a radius and stretch it out, instead of having a continuous radius 360 degrees, you have now what's called a minor and major axis. Where you stretched it out, the distance is obviously larger than the original radius. So in that case, you now have what's called your major axis in that dimension from the center to the outer part. And then from the other direction, which is orthogonal or 90 degrees apart, you have that center and the distance there basically being the minor axis. Mm -hmm. then in the case of the major and minor axis, now something else also occurs in terms of instead of the center, the center is important for the ellipse, but also you have what are called foci. Foci, or, which is plural for focus, in the case of the circle, the focus and, and the foci and the actual center actually coincide. They're in the same point. When you stretch the circle out to become an ellipse, the foci are also stretched out as well. So in reality, the foci are broken into two separate points. So you have a center. Foci is, again, a focal focus. So you have one here, one there. There's two in this case. It turns out that Copernicus was able to determine that in reality, when you have the elliptical orbit, the center is a point in space. But one of the foci is the sun itself. Mm. The other foci is another point in space. The sun is basically one of the foci which our planet orbits around. So that was the thing that was determined by Kepler's first law of motion in terms of the orbits of a planet around a star or sun, in our case, is elliptical. There are other laws, but those, you have to have some mathematical inclination, which, and it's not really that important. But the thing is, there were three laws developed, and that particular law determined the actual nature of the orbit of planets around a star. However, it was not enough actually in terms of proof of why or the geocentric model I mean was wrong I mean technically there was enough but it wasn't it didn't prove for out a shadow of a doubt 
that the geocentric model was wrong. And more importantly, people like Galileo were actually punished by the Catholic Church primarily because what he postulated in terms of a geocentric model went up against the doctrine or the actual dogma of the Catholic Church in terms of the geocentric model. Galileo was not wrong. There was nothing he'd stated that was actually proved to be incorrect. However, he was punished because what he postulated went up against the current education system at the time. But the thing is, Copernicus, Galileo, and uh, Kepler all were actually presenting information that actually was showing cracks in the geocentric model. However, it wasn't until Newton. Newton was actually blessed by God with what's called three laws of motion, which are very critical towards getting to the actual formula that actually presented the nature of the orbits of the planets of the, uh, around the sun, but also the force behind it. The three laws of notion, notion that uh, Newton is credited for are the first basically dealing with the state of inertia. Inertia is a fancy term in mathematics and physics basically dealing to any matter's resistance to change. As you know, we are human beings, we have a solid faith, we are made of matter. We have a resistance to change as does this chair that I'm sitting on, couch I'm sitting on, and all forms of matter unless a certain force can overcome the inertia of that object. In other words, we tend to, this is what the first law of uh, Newton, Newton's first law of motion deals with in terms of bodies at rest tend to stay at rest, and also bodies in motion tend to stay in motion unless some force is exerted on them to either stop them or to speed them. For example, I'm here, I'm sitting in this chair. If I don't move, if you ignore my body movements, I will stay here unless something forces me up or forces me out, like a giant wind or some sort of person or something that can overcome my body inertia to push me out. That's the whole concept of inertia in terms of being able to resist change. The same thing in motion. Although we live on a planet where we have to stop because of things like air friction and gravity, if you're in space itself where the gravitational field is so weak it can be considered zero, or where if two, two gravitational forces are canceling each other out, where it's considered zero gravity. You can have a case where if you're set in motion, you will continue to stay in motion unless something acts on pollen you to stop you. So again, that's Newton's first law. Newton's second law deals with the concept of force is a product of mass and acceleration. Acceleration basically being a vector quantity or a derivative, which again, I can't really go into all that detail now because that requires some real heavy level f calculus. But acceleration is what you call a vector, a quantity that has not just magnitude but direction. If you pr take the product of that acceleration to mass, which is a scalar quantity, you get force, which is also a vector as well. That's another important law that has very, very, very strong applications in many parts of mathematics, physics, and engineering as well. The third law of Newton's law talks about for every action there's an equal and opposite reaction. This attests to the fact that, for example, if you want to get, like if you're lying on the floor and you're trying to get up, the way, like if you're lying face down and you're trying to get up, you push up against the floor to get pushed yourself in the opposite direction. In other words, even though you're exerting a force that's downwards onto the floor, the body will ultimately move upwards. That's again an example of Newton's third law, and for every action there's an equal yet opposite reaction. Mm -hmm. These three laws of motion led to then what was really what Newton's credited for in terms of what's called the universal gravitation law. The universal gravitation law, although technically it explains the nature of if you have any two masses, it doesn't matter how small or how large, and a distance between those two masses, there's a gravitational force between them. Why is that? Because matter, anything that has mass, exerts a gravitational force. Gravitational force comes about through the nature of mass and its relation to other masses. Now, technically, on the level on humans, we don't exert that heavy gravitational force because our mass is not that large. And the distance between us isn't that very large either. However, when you talk about something the size of a planet, which is mm -hmm. millions upon millions of tons, and stars, which are far even larger than planets. You then talk about things that are massive in size and also have massive distance. They're going to exert extremely large gravitational forces. In effect, Newton's law, G m1, m2, m1 being your first mass, m2 being your second mass, g being what's called a gravitational constant, and minus fr squared, f being force, 
r being the distance between those two masses squared, r squared, equals zero, that partic particular formula, it seems abstract, it seems like a bore, that formula was what propelled the Europeans into global leadership. First, not only did it decode and break down not only the geocentric model for good, it also proved the actual, what Kepler did mathematically and empirically in terms of showing the orbit of a planet's elliptical, the G M1 M2 minus FR squared not only proved that to be the case, but also provided the reason why it's the case, which is gravity. Gravity is the reason why our planet has the orbits around it. Without gravity, you can't talk about orbit. Without orbit, you can't talk about seasons. Without seasons, you can't talk about life on Earth. All that comes about through gravity. It seems like an abstract concept, but life would not exist on Earth if it did not have that gravitational force. Can you hold? Sure. Ah, we were talking about gravity. Can you continue? You know where you left off? Yes, I know. Please. Gravity, again, was actually verified through the actual formula in terms of G M1 M2 minus F R squared equals zero, which is what's Newton's gravitation law. However, why that formula is also important is, although many people listening may just think all that is abstract or it doesn't have any relationship to what we were just talking about before, but why the formula is really understood as something critical, and, and like I said, equations liberate people into positions of leadership, is what it actually did for the European people in general. Newton's formula also was known as the basis for what's called the Industrial Revolution. G M1 M2 minus F R squared actually initiated the Industrial Revolution in Europe. Many people are not aware of that, but that's what happened. How? The formula itself provided the means of being able to provide the ability for Europeans to produce more ac or accurate uh, weapons like uh, cannonballs, because the whole point is by the actual formula, it allowed them to actually design such technologies better and interchangeable parts and other things that required technology. The whole part of industrial revolution is the ability to create or to use technology, and the formula was able to be actually applied to actually uh, make sure that Europe was actually now in the lead in terms of technological advancement. The other thing that's important is that the people, uh, uh, Newton's people, in terms of his fellow English and Europeans, recognized what he did and uh, saw the benefit of the formula for the people. For example, Father Lucas who was an actual ordained minister of the Church of England at the time. He actually saw what Newton did at Cambridge, Cambridge University in England, in terms of the formula. Now, Father Lucas was not a mathematician, he was not a physicist. However, he recognized that the formula liberated the English and the European people in general into a position of leadership. What he did was he called upon the Church of England to raise funds to create what's called the Lucasian Professorship. The Lucasian Professorship is now known as the Newton's Chair. Sir, uh, Sir Professor Isaac Newton was the first, or the, I believe, sorry, he was one of the actual holders of that Newton's Chair. He was one of his famous successors, right, uh, is the former, uh, 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 former um, Lucasian Professorship, now the Newton Chairholder, the former Newton Chairholder being Sir Stephen Hawking. That's one thing. Again, like I said, Father Lucas was not a mathematician. He was not a physicist. However, he recognized that Gagat, uh, excuse me, that the G M1 M2 minus F R squared formula would benefit the European people. And so he was able to get members of the church together to raise funds to create a chair to honor that particular discovery, which, is, which formerly was known as the Lucasian Professorship, but is now known as the Newton's Chair. The second thing is Sir Edmund Haley, Edmund Haley being a contemporary of Newton, who was also a famous British astronomer and mathematician, was one of the many who was searching for this formula. Like I said, although I was talking about Copernicus, Galileo, and uh, Kepler and the other societies outside of England, in England they were searching for this particular formula and understanding of the gravitation law. Uh, Edmund Haley was one of those people who was searching for it. However, he was good friends of Newton, and when, found out, when he had found out that Newton had actually been blessed by and ordained by God with that formula, Haley could have acted many ways. Haley could have gotten jealous or angry and decided to go against Newton, because after all, he was searching for that formula Newton was blessed with. However, Haley did not go that route, although he could have easily been justified as being, uh, going that route. 
He understood that the formula's true purpose was to benefit the European people and the English Hold on. Mm, he recognized? Sir Edmund Haley recognized that even though Newton had come up with the formula he had been searching for, he knew that going a jealous route or getting into a, a, such an antagonistic mode would not be beneficial to the people. Instead, he took a better route in terms of realizing that the formula was going to benefit the European people in general. So he put up money to actually help Newton publish his work in the book called Principia in 1687. The key to understand it is Haley was, like I said, a contemporary of Newton's and was looking for that same formula that Newton was ordained by God with. Even upon finding that Newton had found the formula and he had not, he recognized that blessing in terms of the formula being a benefit to the European people and put money down from his own pocket to help fund the publication of that work, not giving the money to Newton but making sure that the work was published as a means of being able for people to study it at Cambridge and to also benefit the European people in Cambridge and throughout the European world. Newton, after his discovery, several things happened to him that many people, if they don't have the Gagat background or understanding from Gagat, would not be able to actually decode. For example, Newton was actually ordained a minister of the Church of England. Why was a physicist who had no connection with the so-called theocracy be actually ordained and minister of the Church of England? It's because the Church of England, like I said, through Father Lucas and other churches in terms of the Church of England, recognized Newton's formula as a blessing that would benefit the European people. The same thing happened with the Parliament in terms of Newton was ordained a member of Parliament. Why again is a physicist being actually elected into the actual ruling class of England? or the actual uh, particular legislative branch of England. It's because they recognized the formula would benefit <coughs> the European people. Newton also was actually made the royal, uh, uh, master of the royal mint. The royal mint in England is the actual source of the money or currency in that country which the money is produced and created. Again, you might be asking yourself, why is a physicist or a mathematician being put in charge of the mint? The reason why they put him in that position is because, because of the formula, the European people recognized Newton as a person whose intelligence can be used and applied to solve real life problems that the European people were suffering from. In mm. particular, Europe was suffering in England at that time in the late 1600s, early 1700s, Europe and England was suffering from a serious counterfeiting problem. And because God had blessed Professor Newton with the GM1 M2 minus FR squared equals zero formula, which obviously showed uh, Newton to be of in supreme intelligence or having a great deal of intelligence, the European people realized that his intelligence could be applied and used to a problem that they were suffering from, which he was able to apply and solve. Newton was able to use his intelligence through the formula to solve the counterfeiting problem and actually capture the counterfeiters in that time. So again, he was ordained a minister of the Church of England. He was knighted. He was actually given, uh, also ordained to actual a member of parliament, and he was made the master of the royal mint. All this came about because of the formula. Again, the European people didn't do this because of Newton, or they did not do it for Newton. They did it for their people. They recognized Newton was the discoverer, the person ordained by God with the formula. But the formula lifted the European people from a position of beforehand where they fought them, uh, where they're not considered the best, to now being in a position of leadership. And this, demonstrated, this has been demonstrated by many ways. The English in the majority in reality also took charge, and the Germans, which I'll explain as well. But the English took charge by the fact that at the same time Newton's formula was actually developed. You have here in America, originally the Dutch controlled um, uh, what you call New York City, or the area called New Amsterdam. The English soon took over, which became New York. It's not a coincidence the time period of that taking over by the English and the Newton's formula happened to coincide in the late 1600s. Also, you also have the concept of America. Uh, America, sp what's the language spoken in America? English. Although, yes, you may talk about the American Revolution, the War of 1812, America fighting England. There's still a connection deeply between this country and the ruling party and England's monarchy. But again, it goes also to the point about the formulas changing people's lives. The Germans, as I was explaining before, the English solved the problem that the Germans were looking very close to solve. Like I said, Kepler 
had come very close to coming up with the actual formulation of what Newton did. Like I said, Kepler's research was empirical through actual observation, but he was able to use mathematics to determine the actual nature of orbits in terms of being elliptical. Unfortunately, Kepler was not able to actually describe or understand gravity through his actual empirical research, gravity actually being the force behind the actual orbit. So Kepler was a German, and like I said, the Germans wanted to actually come up with that formula that Newton was blessed with. However, upon finding out that Newton had been ordained by God with the formula, the Germans actually did something very fascinating. Professor Hugo told me about the insight about the German people in terms of they don't get mad, they get even. So the Germans actually took over the English monarchy and the English country. The last truly English monarch was back in 1702, which is Queen Anne. I believe it was the same per, uh, monarch who actually knighted Newton. I may not be, I may be wrong about that, but I believe she was the same person who knighted uh, Newton in terms of for the um, uh, e, uh, GM1 M2 minus FR squared equals zero formula. But after Queen Anne, the ruling family from 1702 to even this day, 2013, are a German family called the Habsburgs. Queen Elizabeth II, who is supposed to be in charge of the monarchy of England now, is a German as was Queen Victoria, as of all the King Georges from one to six, even King George III, who was supposed to be the king of the English during the actual American Revolution here, was actually said to have only spoken German on the English throne. So again, the reason why that's important is the Germans recognized the blessing of that formula. They understood it so much that even though they were very close to finding it, when they found out that they were not the ones to find it, they took over the country where that formula came from, and they've still they've not let, let loose of that country yet. Like I said, the current monarch that's still there in England is German. So that is a key towards understanding that formulas liberate people into positions of leadership in the case of the Europeans. And like I said, the formula was the basis of the Industrial Revolution and the ability for the Europeans to claim supremacy over all through technology coming out of that formula. If you go to the 1900s, you have in 1905 a formula coming from a Jewish ma uh, mathematical physicist by the name of Professor Albert Einstein called E minus mc squared equals zero, which is the theory of relativity. Why is this particularly important? This formula was blessed by God through a Jewish mathematician, mathematical physicist as a means of being able to liberate the Jewish people out of position of horrors they were suffering from at the time. Einstein lived in Germany in terms of Germany's at that time, even before the Second World War and even before the First, when they considered Jewish uh, citizens or Jewish people that were in Germany as second class or third class citizens. One of the jokes that Einstein had, not necessarily funny, but trying to invoke humor in a very horrible situation, was talking about in Germany there were signs that said things like, dogs and Jews not welcome here. And Einstein always questioned or basically brought up the point of he was always surprised about how dogs came first. It's not funny. It's a horrible situation. But the thing is, he was illustrating the way how Jewish people were viewed in Germany at that time. So Newton, sorry, Einstein was hoping through the re revelation of, from God of E minus mc squared equals zero, the theory of relativity. He could use the formula to represent the Jewish people in Germany and establish a partnership between the WASP Germans and the Jewish Germans in terms of illustrating to the WASP Germans, hey, we Jewish Germans can accomplish things, we can demonstrate intelligence, we are viable and productive members of society. The Germans, unfortunately, however, have a very high, what you call, superiority complex in terms of believing themselves to be better than everyone. Like I said, they already took over England in the, in the case of the GM1, M2 minus FR squared equals zero formula as a means of making sure that even though they were not the ones blessed by God with the formula, that they controlled the country where it came from. They see themselves as the supreme intelligence. They did not want to have a joint partnership with the Jewish people. So unfortunately, Einstein was rejected. And ultimately, uh, in later years, in the 20s and late 1910s uh, and early uh, 1920s, Einstein was forced to leave Germany because and again, it goes back to the point I was illustrating about the, 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 the Europeans fight wars on the basis of supremacy. The First World War from 1914 to 1918 was a basis of the Germans trying to use physical and military might to actually force the world into accepting them as being supreme. Or as a supreme. 
they failed in that attempt and they lost the war. But again, they did not, because the war was settled in an armistice, which is what you can consider somewhat of like a ceasefire in uh, November 11th, 1918. The problem is the Germans had con uh, believed themselves to, technically, even though they signed the armistice, they didn't believe that they actually lost the war. And because of the supremacy mindset, they were looking for an excuse to blame or someone to blame for the problem, which ultimately, unfortunately, the Jewish people were the scapegoats. But because of that, and then the Nazi uprising in the 20s, Einstein was forced to leave Germany. And because, and because they'd failed to actually establish a joint citizenship between the Jewish people and the WASP in Germany, and because of the Nazi uprising, and one of the unfortunate things that people don't realize is, in Germany before Einstein left, his uh, book was actually burnt by one of the uh, Nazis uh, burning books rallies. They actually burnt his book and called his book an erroneous Jew theory. And also Einstein's home later after he left was converted to a Nazi youth uh, training center. But the thing is Einstein had, was forced to leave Germany to come to America. In America, Einstein actually was recognized and supported by Jewish Americans in the country. And they understood that the formula E minus epsilon squared equals zero would be a, a tremendous benefit to the Jewish people. So two things happened. The synagogues here in America, and also abroad, but particularly in America, raised funds to create an institute as a home for that formula. Because right now, Einstein, at that point in the 20s when Einstein came to America, there was no official home for the actual relativity discovery. Unlike Newton, where there was a home already established through Cambridge, there was no such home in the case of relativity. So the synagogues raised funds for a home for that formula. Again, they did not raise funds for Einstein. They raised funds for creating a home for the relativity theory. On that same note, you have a businessman by the name of Bamberger, another uh, Jewish businessman, who recognized the significance of that formula and recognized that the formula would benefit the Jewish people. So they would raise funds also to assist the goal of the synagogues in terms of raising funds for a home for that, in this formula or that discovery. So they have the Jewish synagogues and the actual um, bis Jewish businessmen and others who donated funds to create what's called the Institute for Advanced Studies in Princeton, New Jersey, which is actually a university uh, that is actually connected to Princeton University in Princeton, New Jersey. Institute for Advanced Studies is the home of the relativity discovery and where Einstein was allowed to actually teach and present the formula to other Jewish mathematicians and mathematical scientists and mathematical physicists. So again, the important thing to understand is the Jewish people recognize that the formula E minus mc squared equals zero would benefit the Jewish people and they created a, they raised funds together to create a home for it to, as a means of being able to, for that formula to be taught and actually studied by other Jewish mathematicians and physicists, which is the Institute for Advanced Studies, or IAS, in Princeton, New Jersey. So why that's also important is the following. Upon hearing news in 1939 about the Germans being able to split the uranium atom, this prompted Einstein... Is that what that formula enabled them to do, and if so, how? The formula does that because it understands that energy and mass, or Mass, energy, and momentum all have relations. In physics, when you get into conservation of mass, matter, and momentum, you'll you understand it a little better. But the whole point about conservation means that energy is neither created nor destroyed. And the same mm -hmm. thing with mass. Mass is neither created nor destroyed. It's transformed or it's changed, but it's not actually destroyed in itself. But then that's what the formula deals with, a relationship between energy and mass. If you have E minus mc squared equals zero, that's the formula it represents. It's through that formula that you can break the concept of the atom or split the atom and later on, as I was just getting into, once that news about the Germans in 1939, two German scientists were able to break the atom or the uranium atom into a process called fission process. This prompted Einstein and other Jewish scientists to write a letter to uh, the president at the time, FDR, who was a wasp. Uh, Franklin Delano, Delano Roosevelt was actually written a letter from Einstein actually urging him the dangers of not taking action with E minus mc squared equals zero here in America, and that if not taking action with that formula, the Germans could very well devise a weapon that could help them win the war, Second World War. 
because of the support Einstein had from the Jewish community and also because of his standing in terms of his position due to relativity, he made an impact upon FDR. And so what happened was a collective effort between the Jewish Americans here in America representing scientists for the most part and the WASP Americans representing the military, also led, led by General Leslie Grove. They had a partnership which, was called, which led to what's called the Manhattan Project. The Manhattan Project was a project that allowed the Jewish scientists, primarily who most of them were taught by, uh, through the IAS, about the actual relativity discovery. And also J. Robert Oppenheimer was the actual figurehead there, though Einstein technically was the actual person behind the actual formula that was used to create the bomb. Oppenheimer was a way of basically trying to they still credited Einstein, but they, Einstein was not directly seen there on the, a direct front. Mm -hmm. Oppenheimer was the front person who represented him. But the thing is, the, it was a collaboration between the Jewish people and the WASP people. Within that project, they were able to create what's called the atomic bomb. And through the creation of that weapon, it was actually helped the European, the, the, uh, America win the Second World War in 1945. As you know, the bomb was dropped in uh, J uh, J uh, Japan. And one of the reasons why it wasn't dropped in Germany was primarily two reasons. One, there were Jewish people in Germany, so they didn't want to test such a weapon after the Jewish people there. They were less likely to be Jew Jewish people in Japan, since J Japanese, although they were allies to the Germans, they weren't technically European. And the other thing is the WASP also didn't want to use such a weapon on, uh, on their own fellow WASP as well, because even though the Germans were the enemy, they still, the weapon was, like I said, the first time unused. They didn't know what the effects would be. And of the two uh, places, Germany and Japan, Japan was least likely to have any European component. Mm -hmm. So they were really more willing to test the bomb on Germ in Japan than on Germany. Like I said, there were Jews in Germany a lot more than there were in Japan, and there were more WASP in Germany. And like I said, they wanted to win the war, but at the same time, they didn't know the effects of the weapon, uh, or what would do to the Jews or the German uh, WASP in Germany. They were more willing to try it in Japan than in uh, Germany because of that reason. But things happened after the Second World War that many people, again, if they didn't understand the coded nature of Gaga, I mean, the coded nature of what happened for the formula that Gaga provides, they wouldn't understand it. The war was ended in 1945. Three years later, in 1948, you finally have the establishment of what's called the State of Israel. It's not a coincidence or a, a, a so-called uh, surprise. The basis behind why Israel was created three years after the end of the, uh, that war, the Second World War, was because of the fact that the Europeans here in America recognized the fact that the relativity formula, which came through Newton, E minus m squared equals zero, helped them create the bomb that helped them win the war. So in awarding him for that victory, uh, Israel was actually established in less than three years after the end of the war. This other thing that's important to understand is also, as you can see up to today, the Europeans, particularly here in America, support whatever Israel wants, primarily because of the understanding that the formula coming from a Jewish mathematic mathematical physicist saved America and ultimately made it superpower it is today, because also the creation of that bomb ultimately eliminated America in terms of just being seen as a powerful nation, but as a superpower. Right. Only the USSR was in competition, or the Russians were in competition for a long time, and even then the Russians broke down. But the thing is, as you know, the Cold War. Mm -hmm. But the thing is, the important thing is that America became a superpower because of that. So they ultimately struck up a deal which helped them create Israel. The other thing that's also important is then, in 1952, the Prime Minister of Israel, David Ben-Gurion, traveled from Israel to come here to America to visit Einstein in Princeton, New Jersey to offer Einstein the presidency. Now why would they be offering a presidency to a man who's not a politician but a mathematical physicist? Mm -hmm. It's because the Jewish people recognized that Einstein's formula saved them from the horrors they were suffering in Germany and in Europe in terms of the actual Holocaust. The gas chambers and such horrible nasty ways of being murdered in Germany was put to an end because of the formula. They recognized that and that's why they were offering the presidency to Einstein. Einstein declined, but the important part is they offered it to Einstein because they recognized that the formula saved the Jewish people from the horrors they were facing. So why that's important is again, like GM1, M2 minus FR squared liberated or actually, wrote, actually elevated Europeans into a position of leadership, 
e minus mc squared equals zero also liberated, actually liberated and actually elevated the Jewish people into a position of leadership. That's demonstrated by many ways. The Jewish people, though not technically being declared actual physical president of this country, they have, like I said, a lot of their support. I mean, a lot of the Jewish people in terms of in the government are supporting the government primarily because of their connection in terms of the formula and with the, they show that support in terms of the support America has with Israel. But more importantly, Alan Greenspan, who was for the longest time controlling of the actual Federal Reserve, mm -hmm. is also another individual who is Jewish. Mm -hmm. So again, even though again they weren't actually presidents of America, they actually controlled the money of this country, which is a very powerful position. So again, it liberated them into a position of leadership. Mm -hmm. Gagat, on the other hand, is not just any formula, but the formula which both G, uh, GM1, M2 minus FR squared and equals zero, and E minus MC squared equals zero originate out of. There are but small subsets, like I said. Eta sub N, where N is equal to zero and N is equal to one, both reproduce those formulas of Einstein and Newton's respectively. Why that's important is though, whereas those equations were actually achieved through Newton and Einstein through uh, so-called research or guesswork in some aspects, Einstein's formula and Newton's formula can be derived from E eta sub n specifically and mathematically. All of those equations come out of Gagan, and they're just what's, like I said, eta sub n is infinite, and yet you're talking about only two solutions out of an infinite set of solutions. You can see how Gagan can be considered the mother equation of relativity and universal gravitation law. Now, when you say that those two are just two equations yes. that come out of Gagat, which is the mother of all equations, but how can you prove that? Because the fact that if you have eta sub zero, n being zero, eta sub n being n equals zero, you can reproduce relativity. If you have eta sub n being n being one, you can reproduce Newton's uh, gra uh, gravitation law. So why that's important is the fact that those formulas, and they haven't re actually proved to be true through the books that Professor Udall's published, New Group Theory for Mathematical Physics, Gas Dynamics, and Turbulence, and the Grand Unified Theorem book actually verifies the proof of Einstein's formula and theory from the New Group Theory that comes from Professor Ebo. And the same thing is done also for gravitational force in terms of it's been proved to be actually originate out of Gagat. Those books have that. And people in the AMS and EMS, like Professor Grigor Sagas, have actually tested, Professor Grigor Sagas, who is a mathematical legend in the uh, AMS and EMS communities, in terms of having over 200 mathematical reviews, or MRs, actually specifically stated that the particular development from Gagat has proved Einstein's theory mathematically. So it's now, Gagat has proved it through because it, it came out of Gagat as well as um, proving the actual unified uh, gravitation law. So universal gravitation law. So why this again is important, it stems from the fact of Gagat being where the mother source for equation. Like I said, Gagat contains all theorems and all everything that exists. Gij is the ultimate origin of everything that exists. So again, the fo formulations for relativity Formulations for universal gravitation law are all embedded within that GIJ. So Gagat has the solutions to all those problems, and that's what's been presented. So why that's important is the fact that if relativity can lift the Jewish people out of the hell they were suffering from, if uh, universal gravitation law can lift the European people into global leadership, and Gagat is the mother equation of both those formulas, Gagat now has liberated the black people not just into a position of actual being free, but in a position of being the leaders because we are now dubbed the most intelligent. Like I said, the formula which presents that uh, eta sub n is the infinite intelligence polymorphism. And a gagat contains every infinite intelligence polymorphism, which means there's no limit, there's no end. So by that being declared, it means that God has blessed Professor Oyibo with the ability to understand everything in the universe. And by that understanding, that means that Professor Yibo has been ordained by God as the most intelligent human being because he can understand everything. Everything in space has been compressed or being a, has been the ability to be compressed and collapsed within Professor Yibo's brains and be understood and deciphered and comprehended. So that makes Professor Yibo the most intelligent human being. That makes Africans by extension because we share the genes Professor G. Yibo has. 
as the most intelligent race. So several things now come out. Black people now have been liberated into a position of global leadership. The problem is the Jim Crow hangover is what needs to be busted. Again, Jim Crow is where the problem originates from. When black people originally, like a perfect example of the Jim Crow fraud comes from the Juneteenth situation in terms of, as you know, the American Civil War here in America was fought between 18, from 1861 to 1865. And in the middle of that, in 1863, they declared what's called the Emancipation Proclamation, which is supposed to free black people off the actual, um, uh, off the plantations. Right. In 1865, the war was officially over, but yet a year later, in 1866, it was discovered that there were plantation Texases and plantations in Texas that still had black people working on those plantations as, as if this, yes, as if nothing had happened or they had not been freed. That's an example of the hangover because they were not aware and because Jim Crow refused to tell them the truth. They were still black people were still acting in the old way in terms of believing that they were supposed to be there when they weren't. The same thing now is the danger we want to make sure it does not repeat itself here in terms of black people have been liberated in a position of global leadership because of Gagut. Gagut forced that by the fact that, as again, the Yale study illustrates. The Yale study was a study that was originally conducted and funded by the U.S. government because the Genome Project or anything dealing with genetics is primarily funded by the government. But the thing that's important to understand is the go uh, actual government was funding that study originally to prove that the Europeans were the most intelligent. However, Gog had forced the uh, Europeans and who were conducting the study, whether they're Americans or Europeans from Europe, the, into recognizing the fact that in reality Jim Crow, which they called European bias, had to be removed in order to get the actual correct result, results. And once they removed the Jim Crow, the correct result was obtained in terms of Africans being declared by, as being How, how did Gagat force him to... First uh, of all, Gagat, the formula, is the mother equation, like I said. Relativity originates out of Gagat, as does universal gravitation law. One of the best, best solid proofs of Gagat's existence is to prove that Gagat is wrong, they would ultimately have to prove that Einstein, they would ultimately be proving Einstein's theory of relativity is wrong and Newton's law of gravitation or of gra universal gravitation law is wrong. And considering the Europeans and the Jewish people, especially realizing those particular two are the salvations of their people, neither one are going to openly say that those formulas are wrong and that they're trying to prove that just Gagat's wrong. Gaga, the only way Gaga can be wrong is if relativity is wrong and gravitation force or Newton's gravitation law is wrong. They cannot and they will not show the prove those wrong. So therefore, that is automatically proving that Gaga is correct because Gaga also is proved to be correct because it's the ultimate origin of everything. Everything that exists comes out of it. So Gaga can reproduce Newton's gravitation law. It can reproduce Einstein's gra uh, theory of relativity and everything else, every other formula. Like I said, GIJ is the ultimate origin or the originator of everything. And that's where Gagat uh, basically shows that this, uh, the theory of relativity as well as universal gravitation law comes from. To also answer the other point you're asking about how does Gagat uh, prove that or force the, the Yale study is the fact that Gagat, by declaring Professor Yibo with the ultimate intelligence polymorphism of A to sub N, the polymorphism that they talk about in the Yale study also is the same in terms of the polymorphism dealing with the ability to compress and collapse reality onto the brain. By Professor Yibo being ordained with the ultimate intelligence polymorphism, which means he has infinite intelligence polymorphisms, and because the formula he has, A to sub N, is where not only the origin of polymorphisms, but containing all polymorphisms, the Yale study recognized that as Professor Yibo has been ordained by God with the infinite intelligence. Because the only way you can really understand it is the fact that only Professor Yibo has had that formula. No one else had the A to sub N formula. No, they and say that the Africans, in order to build the pyramids and the temples and the concepts that they had, would have had to understand uh, that formula in ancient times, or would have had to They have. understood some parts of God, um, some parts of the actual form, but not all of it. Because again, there was no formula. Like I said, there was no A to sub N back in those times. Like I said, this is the first time of such a formula has been presented, and presented in such a way that can be proved mathematically. Again, that's again the concept of proof and truth in terms of mathematics, in terms of, mm -hmm. it's not just a declaration, it has been proven to be true. And the proof of that comes from the existence of, or proving existence. 
like we're saying, the existence of the G.I.J., which is the ultimate origin of everything, comes from proving, first of all, God has already defined Gagat or G.I.J. as the ultimate origin of everything. That's from the definition I was explaining before. To prove the existence of the G.I.J. as being the ultimate origin of everything, you can show that by proving that you exist as a human being. Right, sir? Mm -hmm. The reason goes as follows. Human beings exist, or human existence, proves the existence of the G.I.J. because G.I.J. has been proven to be the ultimate, or infallibly proved to be the ultimate origin of everything. Human beings can only exist out of that G.I.J. If the G.I.J. did not exist, the human beings could not exist. But since you do exist, you are automatically a proof of the G.I.J. that exists in order for you to originate out. So that's basically a proof of the G.I.J. It is also defined that the G.I.J. has infallibly defined as God. Mm -hmm. So when you say human existence infallibly proves the existence of G.I.J. and G.I.J. has been infallibly proved to be God, you can replace the G.I.J. with God to now say human existence infallibly proves the existence of God. That's the God defined by Gagat, however. The God defined by religion or by religious experience is what you call the creator. So God in, defined by Gagat is the originator of everything. God defined by uh, religion is the creator of everything. So in reality, the only difference, the f actual physical difference in terms of statements is the terms creator and originator. But creator and originator means the same thing in terms of where something comes out of. So in effect, they're basically the same. That's how Gagat resolves the issue of G.I.J. and God. But just dealing with the G.I.J., proving that a human being exists proves the existence of G.I.J. G.I.J. is proven to be the ultimate origin of everything. Since it is the ultimate origin of everything, the solutions to all those problems, like relativity, uh, universal gravitation law, and every other mathematics problem, and every other problem in reality, past, present, and future, all come out of that G.I.J. Mm. Um. Is there anything else uh, you want to go before we close this class? And this is definitely a class. <laughs> yes. Like I said, this is only a fraction of what people are going to get in the briefing. I'm only giving you a sample to whet your appetite. But the thing is that Gagat has provided us a means of being able to save our people's lives and accomplishing the goal that Dr. King, uh, Dr. Um, Malcolm X, and uh, uh, Professor James Brown all gave their lives for in terms of solving the problems of black people's having a slow self-esteem and hatred of themselves because of Jim Crow. Jim Crow has been destroyed through Gagat, and the basis of Jim Crow being destroyed by Gagat can only be understood through the briefing. It's in coded form and most of the documents I talk about in terms of the Yale study, the mm -hmm. Gottingen list, the um, Dasgupta's message, and others. All these are coded messages that are illustrating the defeat of Jim Crow and the victory of Gagat over Jim Crow. But because it's in code most black and hidden from most black people, they're not going to understand it. So one of the reasons why we want people to come to this briefing is so that they can understand how God has destroyed the Jim Crow. The same Jim Crow that is caused mm -hmm. that actually is Malcolm, Brother Malcolm, sorry, Dr. Malcolm X illustrated that is caused black people to hate themselves or to start to uh, see them to be ashamed of who they are. The same the, the Jim Crow that uh, Professor James Brown realized he had to destroy through Say It Loud, I'm Black and I'm Proud back in 1968. The same Jim Crow that upon listening to Drs. Malcolm X and Dr. K, um, and Rev uh, sorry, James Brown, realizing that that particular discovery destroy, I mean, that, that, that those particular uh, documentations were forcing him to really confront the real issue that black people were prob having a problem with, not on voting rights or on uh, legislation in terms of amendments, but rather dealing with the problem of black people losing their manhood, and more importantly, that black people being hate hating themselves or having self-hatred of themselves because of their Jim Crow fraud. So Jim Crow has been defeated by Gaga, but now it's a matter of our people being aware, being led, uh, uh, getting to understand that, and realizing that Jim Crow has been busted due to Gaga. So that's the reason why people should come into the briefing. The briefing is roughly $550 per person. And like I said, you'll be within that because of the importance of getting everyone in the actual briefing. The briefing normally was allowing people to get at least one book, one publication, a new publication in terms of the Gagat Journal or the Gagat Book on the Riemann Hypothesis. But unfortunately, 
uh, I didn't get a chance to go into the Riemann hypothesis, but the thing that's critical is that the particular book and journal on the Riemann hypothesis, one of them was being offered with the person and they registered for, for the actual course. But in light of the need of getting a 10,000 audience, at the very least, we're willing to give up, uh, we present, uh, give up two books for each person for the $550 price. But it requires the audiences to be in the 7,000, I mean, at 7,000 at the very least, but the uh, uh, real, uh, real lease is 10,000 because the important thing is that the mass of people attend this particular briefing. Right now, the mass of people need to attend this briefing because people are dying unnecessarily, like I said, of high blood, dis uh, high blood pressure, heart disease, stroke, and other such situations. And because of that, that is the reason why black people are unfortunately dying in higher numbers. On the same note, as I said before, it's a matter of intelligence. Yale's study has actually proven that it's mathematical because it's God's order, but it's scientific and official through Yale study that Africans are the most intelligent. Even though Africans, they'd say there are only 28 polymorphisms as compared to 19 polymorphisms for the non-black Africans, in reality, that 28 is an underestimation. There's a lot more uh, intelligence polymorphisms for black people than there are for non-blacks. But the fact that they were even, even able to illustrate that black people had a higher number or a greater intelligence is the victory which Gaga has brought about. The reason why that's so important also is to realize the fact that when talk comes out to it, Gaga has in effect now provided a means of black people to be able to take care of themselves. Mm -hmm. Right now, when you go to a hospital that's not controlled by black people, whether it's LIJ or any other hospital, all those hospitals are controlled by non-blacks, which means people who have six intelligence strands as compared to nine intelligence strands. You're putting your life in unnecessary risk and danger going to someone who's less intelligent to you, expecting to solve your problems. Mm -hmm. So the critical thing now that needs to be interpreted is that Gagat has now provided the means for them to solve their problems. And the thing is, you can't expect to go to a six strands of intelligence to solve a problem, especially as a nine strand. It's like a child, like a parent expecting to go to a child to have the child explain to them what's two plus one. The parent is supposed to have superior intelligence to the child and therefore should not be going into a position where they're learning from the child on mm -hmm. that basis. Mm -hmm. Like I said, that situation does not make sense, neither does going to a hospital that is controlled by people of less intelligence. Again, Gaga provides you with the ability to protect your life and understanding of how to do that because it has decoded what is life. But then these are things that the people need to come into the briefing to understand. Mm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, I had to get back to it. Actually, it took uh, 